Hey there, Steve Johnson, Mentor 555 again, coming to you from Medellin, Colombia. Listen, while I was in Austin, you know what I do when I'm there? I have my podcast. I had a chance to sit down with three amazing men, very talented men. They own Five Star Nutrition and Defined Brands. They're all fraternity brothers. They come from Chico State, California, and they moved to Austin. They moved to Texas to conquer the world. But before they could do that, they had to open up their first nutrition store. They did that several years back. Hey, they had some trials, they had some tribulations. They've overcome those. They have over 60 stores now across the country. They're not stopping there. They've got some big plans. So they share their goals with us. They share their backstories. And I think you're gonna enjoy what you hear today. So sit back, enjoy, you know what to do. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. So enjoy this podcast. We appreciate you. All right, big day for us here at Mentor 555. We have three big boys on the show today. We have one Charlie, one Cody, and one Euro Brian coming in from Aspen, Colorado. <laughs> Last time I saw him, he had uh, hair down to the middle of his back, and now he's all cleaned up. And I'm like, Brian, man, you don't have to clean up like this for M55. 555, what's going on? He said, well, he's getting married in May, so he's about to be off the market, guys and girls. But uh, we got the guys here from Five Star Nutrition and Defined Brands. It is a real treat to have you gentlemen on my show today. You're all three very, very much a part of my life. Um, and, of course, Charlie, you spearheaded all of this uh, from when we met, golly, I guess it was probably more than 10 years ago. Almost, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think you had, uh, you had Big Bad Boy Carson in a uh, little carry-on and met you guys coming through an open house. So nice to have you on. Cody, with your three little girls at home, mama at home, you know, I know that your hands are full. And then uh, Big Bad Boy Brian coming in from Aspen. Thank you. Um, you guys crush it in your industry. And that's you know, not just because you're all special in my life and and great dudes, but y'all are fantastic at what you do. And because of that, I wanted to get it out on the street uh, and let us talk about it and crush it out today on our show. So um, y'all have had your business, uh, Five Star Nutrition, Define Brands, which is the parent company. Y'all have had that. Charlie, you opened in what, 2008? Is that right? It's 2008. You know, we've had many different kind of uh, revisions of the business. and um, But yeah, 2008 was the first store in South Austin as, okay. a, as a franchise unit mm -hmm. on a different franchise, different, okay. different name. Okay. And then we had many iterations of that company that evolved into Five Star Nutrition and eventually defined brands later down the road. Okay. So 2008, you started solo. It was you swinging for the fences right out of the gate. Was That that was right out of college, right? It was one year out of college. Yeah, I okay. took, a, took a corporate job for about a year and then mm -hmm. decided that, you know, that was unchallenging and just mm -hmm. boring for me and decided mm -hmm. I wanted to try to figure out how to run my own business while staying <laughs> in the health and fitness field. and. Yeah, figured out a way to get a talk my parents into doing a home equity line of credit on their house to get my first loan. No risk. Twenty three year old kid out of college. Hey, mom, dad. <laughs> Figuring it out. You know, yeah. and in California, they could do one hundred and ten percent financing on the value of the home. <laughs> so you're like, mom, dad, you're okay. Just yeah. go to one twenty five. Mm -hmm. I'm your boy. Yeah, yeah. And so I regress <laughs> just a, just a shade here because you guys were fraternity brothers at Chico State, mm -hmm. and um, we all have our boys, and we think about our relationships that we have and had with our with our fraternity brothers, and we know how that foundation that we set with those relationships carry on for the rest of our lives. But not not many of us get that opportunity to to build a business and build the type of business that y'all have in the amount of time that you have. So I really want to dive into that, that brotherhood truly. And, um, and it was at that point that not long after you started, it was just a couple of years that you had, it was, uh, Brian, what was it? Was it 2011 when you came on board? Yeah, it was, it was actually the end of 2010. Okay. So well, yeah, just correct me anytime during the show that you need to correct me, just please, please just do that. <laughs> 2000 yeah, in 2010 is when you came on board. Yeah. So, uh, Charlie was older than I was. So Cody and I were like a grade apart. Um, so I knew Charlie for really just a semester when I was rushing the fraternity. He was, I think that was his last semester. Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't know him that well, but we, you know, we were friends for that period of time. And then I think, you know, two or three years later is, is I'm like nearing my first or my last year of college, like I said, it have been four years later. I had heard that he had gotten involved in this nutrition concept out in Austin. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was really, really into just 
lifting and working out and health and fitness, not so much supplements, but I got in touch with him and was like, Hey, I heard you're doing these nutrition stores. I'm interested in it. Um, I'd love to come out and check out the business over the summer. So I was like, I was going to be a super senior and have one more semester. So I think it would have been summer 2010. I packed my shit up with a buddy of mine and we drove out to Austin and just subleased a place right near campus. And I basically just sat myself in, he had two stores, I think, but I sat myself in one of his stores with, with both him and his manager and just kind of learned the business and watched and made flashcards and, you know, tried to, to learn as much as I could. And then as I, <laughs> as I watched it all, I was like, you know, I, I, I was like, Oh wow, this, this thing does have, you know, kind of strong economics. And it seems like there's a lot more to this than I really thought. And again, I'm, I'm 21, 22 years old, 21, probably I don't know what I want to do at any anyway. And so um, I spent that summer there and um, I liked it. I was good at it. I was kind of like a natural salesperson. And then over the course of the end of that summer, he and I decided to partner on a store in a suburb of Dallas in Plano, Texas. And somehow, I don't know, somehow all the thinking of all the different things that had to align for this to work as I'm telling the story. But so we went up there, we found a location. I had some family that lived in Plano and my older half brother and his family. And we literally found a location and it was going to deliver, you know, towards the beginning of 2020 or excuse me, 2011. And so the timing worked for me to go back, finish my last semester, just in time to, to pack my shit and drive out. I don't know, a week after graduation and, mm -hmm. and then just kind of jump into this store and figure out how to get it all put together and opened. And, and this so that was, was and, how, and this led up to when Cody came on board in 2012. Yep. Is that right? Yeah. So yep. I had kind of watched. I mean, you're seeing your boys. You're like, okay, all right, these boys are crushing it. And you were still in school at the time? <laughs> no, I had graduated and took like an entry level sales job, cold calling, and just spent majority of my day avoiding work and hiding in the bathroom. And kind of like what Charlie and Brian are doing now. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, had, had been, you know, doing this job, talking to Brian, ordering subs from him. And at, at a certain point, I was just kind of ready to, for something else. And I think Brian maybe had texted me or called me and said Charlie had a manager that was getting ready to move on. And I think a week later, I packed my bags and rolled out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so were you uh, were you still up in the area, up in Chico State territory at that time? Or? Yeah, I was in Sacramento, okay. living with my parents, mm -hmm. living the high life. <laughs> living the high life? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So I think that the high life was probably when Hartwig was a senior and Marver was a freshman because he skipped past that pretty quick because I think that we all know what the outgoing seniors are doing to the incoming freshmen. <laughs> and I, I'm just going to say at Chico State, they probably have a different set of rules there than they do at maybe some other universities. So is there anything that we should know, Hartwig? Well, I mean, unfortunately, when, when yeah. Brian had rushed, I think I think we got kicked off campus that very year. Yeah, that was the semester <laughs> that, was, that uh, we got kicked off the campus. Of, so. Is that right? Theta Pi in, uh, in, in 2007. Yeah. I think that was the end was of it. Was that due to hazing? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always, I always look back and I always think about the stuff that I went through, and I think, I think maybe you guys were some of the last that that ever got that treatment, but it was, it was special. Well, sure. what, what, what <sighs> Brian wanted to come clean on on today's show, he's actually the brother that ratted all you guys out. <laughs> <laughs> well, could you imagine? Being that guy? Yeah, you this imagine is like Mario or whatever. <laughs> yeah, hey guys. It, you know, the funny thing is, it's, it's so crazy looking at it now because what, what we got kicked off campus for was an ice bath, and we all do ice baths <laughs> three times a week. So it's like, is that actually that what we got yeah, you're kicked right. off? Yeah. You know what I mean? Huh? Oh my gosh! Is that actually what it we was, got kicked was, off yeah, for? Yeah, put some twenty-pound ice bags no. and uh, of it, you know it, ice in a in a It wasn't the chicken. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the chicken coop. No, it wasn't the chicken <laughs> coop. I mean, the, the ice bath was a child's play. Uh -huh. You know, it's gosh, like, literally. Oh, so you what you're what you're saying, you're saying is you got kicked off for far less than what you actually pulled off behind oh, yeah. the velvet curtain. Is that right? <laughs> From what I hear, yeah. Hey, do me do me a favor, Hartwig. Slide that mic a little closer. I mean, you're just so relaxed. You're just, you know, what about you guys? You guys are easy going here it's like you guys just came from a podcast you're going to a podcast of course i think marver's going to a shoot he's going to a photo shoot looking like that <laughs> kidding me so you guys so you started in 08 marver layers in when you have two stores i'm hearing and yeah, about two, to open yeah, a third two, two going on three uh -huh, okay yeah. and then by the time uh cody came on board how many stores did y'all have 
You were 2000 le- late 2011 or or yeah you guys yeah. had um like you guys November. had four stores About three with Charlie fifth, yeah. and then the the, the fifth, Plano yeah. and we were getting ready to open or y'all were getting ready to open the Allen store and so yeah mm-hmm. so Cody and your first store was, you, uh, your first store was in Austin right and was it South Austin South Austin on Brady Lane is that the one down by the Home Depot and Academy mm-hmm. and all that that's right yeah and what made you choose to come to Austin and open that store uh, you know kind of walk me through that you know? yeah yeah and interestingly I. I had a buddy who I lived with in, in Menlo Park, and um, you know we kind of came up with the idea to do this together. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we, you know, he had just got he he worked for Cisco at the time, um, Webex, I believe. Was and he up in like Dallas Fort Worth? No, mm-hmm. he was in he was in uh, he was in Menlo Park. He was one. Okay. he was you know went to went to school with him. wasn't part of our fraternity, but he had just got back from Dallas, Texas, and was like, man chicks texas chicks you know <laughs> and i was 24 or whatever and um so he and i kind of pointed at austin and uh-huh. said you know we heard austin was cool you yep. remember seeing the real world and all that stuff and, <laughs> and so we kind of pointed at it and we're like let's go let's go there for a weekend uh-huh. and, you know we went down on sixth street and had some fun and, and you're like 23 we, at the time yeah 24 okay. i think 24 and uh we got back and we kind of just said let's put this business model together and you know, interestingly, his uh, his mom was a really successful businesswoman, and and so we had a few calls with um, you know the president of the company of the of the franchise at the time, mm-hmm. and and she ended up um, you know kind of making the call for him, and saying, I just I don't just don't think the business models there and with that so, particular franchise. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we that's the one we that I went with. Uh-huh. So I I liked it. I wanted mm-hmm. to do it, mm-hmm. and and he and I were going to split at that time. We were going to you know I was going to move out, and we mm-hmm. were going to split it and, and do all that. And he kind of backed out at the last minute. Okay. Hence the reason I had to go and figure yeah. out how to how to secure the financing mm-hmm. myself. And mm-hmm. and then yeah, I moved out to Austin by myself and packed my little Nissan truck and, and, you know, <laughs> drove out and, and, you know, I spent the first few months trying to figure out, I know your question was like, how, how did I choose that location? And, and really it was, you know, you, you're coming out as a, you know, 24 year old, right. You mm-hmm. don't have any assets. You don't have, you know, any really fine. You don't have business so, acumen at that time. That, yeah. and, 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 you know, when you're going to sign with a, with a landlord, of course that the economy was much different at that yeah. time. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you found an no open space in, in 2008, they're willing to give you, you know, at least the space, mm-hmm. but you're personally guaranteeing it. And so you're trying to find it. And I had two or three spaces fall through mm-hmm. and finally landed on that one. And it wasn't the best space. I mean, we look back and it was very, you know, BC type real estate, um, but that's not what made the business back then. It was, it was, you know, grassroots marketing, feet on the ground, shaking hands, kissing babies, mm-hmm. handing cards out. And mm-hmm. that's the way we really grew the business. And so, you know, three months into that store there, I think there were 65, it was NutriShop was the franchise or 65 or 70 stores at the time. And mm-hmm. my third month in business, I was number three in the country. Okay. And it was all grassroots meeting people. You and know? you were a franchisee of NutriShop? I was a franchisee okay. at the time. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you open that and you do that. And then when is it that you make the decision to branch off away from NutriShop? Yeah. Unfortunately, there was a, like I said, there was a couple of iterations of that. Okay. So, so Brian and I, um, funny enough, you know, he, he, we had just opened up this store, which was the fourth, the third or the fourth store. I don't remember. It was the, the, maybe the third store up in Plano. And, uh, I called him one day because we were having some arguments with the, you know, the, the head guy at the, at the franchise, mm-hmm. because he was really upset about us carrying a pre-workout supplement from another company because okay. they really wanted you to sell their stuff. Yeah, right. Right. So I called him and he and I had had a couple arguments, the, the CEO of, of NutriShop and, um, you know, I called Brian one day and I was like, yeah, fuck this. We're going to, we're going to do our own thing. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, well, what do you mean by that? And we're like, we're taking down that fucking sign uh-huh. and we're going to come up with our own name and we're going to reach out to manufacturers. We're going to make our own stuff and we're going to do this ourselves. And yeah. he was like, he had just got a sign up. We had just stocked the store. Yeah, so yeah. he and yeah. I. He's like, okay, boss. <laughs> so, I mean, he, no, you know, and he had called a couple people to get advice. And what's funny is the same guy who had backed out of that first store with me said, oh no, you don't want to do that. You know? And, uh, and Brian got to thinking and just said, all right, let's, let's do it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I came up there and we put all the shit on pallets. Mm -hmm. We shipped it back to the franchise. We covered up the sign, I believe with like a fucking banner banner of a new logo we created. I go to alpha graphics, you know, and, you know, and that (laughs) was the test one. So he, you know, a few weeks in was like, you know, he just invested all of his money Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, Uh you know, he got a loan from his parents. So everything we had was into this thing. And we Uh literally shipped back all these supplements (laughs) and said, we're doing this ourselves. Uh And so his store, the one that we had partnered on, 
was the was kind of that first test store that we did that on. And and later on, a few months later, I, I converted my Austin stores and we started doing our own thing. But that was the first iteration. It was called Total Nutrition. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think it was Total Nutrition when you and I met. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, that's I right. remember yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. 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 So, and we, we, you know, we, uh, I mean, you look back and there's just so many you know, in order to get to a certain point, there's yeah. mistakes everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we we made a big mistake. We partnered with a, a manufacturer out of New York, and we were young, you know. And these guys said, "Oh yeah, we we know how to franchise. We can make all your supplements, and uh, you know, we'll do this thing together." And of mm -hmm. course, Brian and I at the time we were non competes, and so we're like, "Oh, we don't want our names on the documents," you mm -hmm. know. And these guys came. Let's bring in. Cody in. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that that's a whole nother story, but that was the first iteration of us kind of saying we wanted to do this thing ourselves, And yeah. we sort of went into the franchise model at that okay. time. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I, I regress because I should have pointed it out at the beginning of the show. Cause I want our guests to understand, you know, where y'all are now. Cause we, we started, you know, right from, as you, as you mentioned, you know, grassroots movement here, but y'all have North of 60 stores, maybe close to 65 stores gross revenues at or near or above 50 million a year, EBITDA plus or minus 10 million, you know, so you guys are truly crushing it with, uh, with your model. And that's some of the things I want to talk about today for the young up and comers who, who maybe have similar aspirations as what y'all had at 23, 24, you know, but, um, clearly you had an entrepreneurial spirit and Cody, I want to hear about yours as well, but just one that comes to mind because you mentioned that, you know, Brian had to borrow some money from his parents. Uh, Brian, you come from an entrepreneurial uh, family. Your your father had a, um, what was it, uh, Halloween Spirit? I'm trying to remember the name of his company that he had. Yeah, Michael. Spirit Halloween. Spirit Halloween. And yeah, so he was a they sold what, consummate to Spencer? entrepreneur. Is that right? Spencer yeah, he sold to Spencer, you know, near, over 20 years ago now. How many locations did they have uh, before they sold? You know, I think it's a good question. I, I want to say it was in the the probably the 50 to 60 range mm -hmm. um, with a, a, at least half of those being like quasi franchise, they called them consignment, but it was more or less like a license where they would, he had friends and family and people that would, you know, pay a license fee and then they would buy the inventory from him and mm -hmm. use the name and everything. So it wasn't exactly a franchise, but they were buying the, the stuff wholesale. Um, so yeah, was the that more amount of units I think as, as we do. How old were you at the time? Were you like 15 or 12 or how old were you? Uh, what year were you? Born? 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was, it was it, let's just say it was 20 years ago. So I would have been, I guess 12, but I think, I think I was probably more like 15. Yeah. I was probably more like 14, 13, so yeah, 14. Yeah. I just put I you think. on the spot. Your, your fiance, when she watches this, she's going to be, wait, you said you were 32, dude. And she's going to do the math and <laughs> you know, we're soon going to find out. But the reason for me, why, why that's relevant is, you know, your, your, your parents had that business since you were, since you can remember as a kid, it builds up, they have that 50 to right. 60, you know, locations. And what was your, you know, what was your experience as a kid growing up and seeing that, you know, seeing your parents as entrepreneurs, did you envision that you would do something similar as you grew up and started your uh, business world? You know, I think, It'd be easy to say, absolutely sure, like that was my plan. But I think, you know, growing up, my dad worked all the time. My my parents got divorced when I was young, so my mom she she was part of the business initially, and then when they got divorced, he kept the business. And you know, I split time with my parents or whatever. Um, so you know, I was I was I worked the first job I ever had when I was fourteen. I worked in spirit stores. I set spirit stores up over summers, like, you know, working three in the morning to noon and working like a graveyard. And so I spent time in the business, but I think having parents that were entrepreneurs, probably if anything, it just seemed more normal mm -hmm. than maybe the average person. So, you know, as I'm going through college or whatever, and I don't know what I want to do, but the prospect of like having my own business seemed very reasonable mm -hmm. and, and normal. And I think for a lot of people that don't grow up that way, it's probably, a lot more of a stretch or yeah. they consider all the statistics about failure and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And like, to me, that wasn't even really a thing. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have my own business. Just don't know what it is or how well, I wasn't make a good point. worried about it, you know, until you, it presented me. itself. Yeah. And, yeah, and go ahead. didn't mean to step on your words. That's probably the delay that we have here, but the, um, I would say that you take a, the mindset of maybe, you know, and we see it all the time, right? We have buddies 
who their dad or their mom was an attorney or is an attorney. Now they're an attorney or they were a physician and, or a surgeon and there, and there's just a lineage of that. Right. And I think you see something similar with those that have it in their blood, the entrepreneurial spirit, like what we're talking about with you, Brian, would you agree with that? I would. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's nature or nurture, but it's certainly one of those two. Mm -hmm. Was that probably and, a little and, bit of and, both. Was that the setup where they would go into like vacant shopping centers and set up the shop for the Halloween and set it up a couple months in yep. advance? And would and I always wondered, so I'm glad we're talking about this. Um, <laughs> would y'all get like a, a sweetheart of a deal on the lease because you're like, hey, we're only going to have it for three or four months at a time? Uh, I mean, I think the answer is that that you know they were paying top dollar for that period. Yeah. So, you know, if a, if a landlord's like, oh, I can take, you know, three or four months of cash real quick before I drop in this long-term tenant. And mm -hmm. I think when you think of the cycle of business and retail, you know, you just always had these big boxes that were going out of business mm -hmm. in this cycle and presenting these good real estate opportunities and these big anchored centers. And, you know, they were a tenant that could come in, didn't need any TI, they could take it as it was real quick. And so for, you know, landlord could make a quick 50 or a hundred grand, mm -hmm. you know, the struggle for them, of course, was how do you how do you keep the same real estate year over year? Yeah. So you, you couldn't necessarily, so you're always, you know, that was what the whole off season was spent doing mm -hmm. was finding real estate. Well, why I think that's relevant and why I went off on that tangent is because, you know, knowing you men for as long as I have and knowing how y'all are ruthless at negotiating your, your lease spaces. I mean, y'all are really, really savvy in that. And so that's why I wanted to drill down on that a little bit. Like, do you feel like that you learned some of those skills from that, or is it all no. straight from Charlie Hartwig? <laughs> it's all from Charlie Hartwig. I mean, that guy, that guy I wasn't, is ruthless, isn't he? I didn't yeah. have proximity to that stuff. I was too young. So, like, all, you know, I didn't know what my dad was doing. I knew he owned Spirit. I knew he worked all the time. And then when I was in the store, I guess at 14, you know, maybe the last couple of years he owned it. But I, I didn't know the all the, the underpinnings and all the business workings of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's coincidental, honestly. Well, I'm just giving you more credit than you probably deserve is what that boils mm -hmm. down to. <laughs> what about you, no, Cody? I'm my negotiating from Charlie. <laughs> I'll admit that. Charlie's <laughs> the only one I know that comes to a podcast with brass knuckles. I'm not even sure why he did that, but you know, <laughs> teach their own. What about you, Cody? Where do you get that spirit from? Um, really just watching these guys, like I, I don't really view myself as that entrepreneurial type. Um, but as I worked for these guys, I, I, I didn't own a store out of the gates. I started working for them and just observed them executing the playbook that they had put together. And over time, you know, I had spent enough time observing it and got my opportunity to go open up my own store out in Tyler, Texas, basically got their, uh, leftovers. They had a lease that mm -hmm. they had negotiated and, um, didn't have the manpower or took a couple, a couple other opportunities instead. And, uh, that was my segue into owning a store. And mm -hmm. really just from there was watching them and, you know, I would make my little iterations on it, but I just stuck to the playbook. And I think that's, uh, like anybody, like what we do is not super special. It's mm -hmm. really how you execute it. Cause we could, we say this sometimes, like we could give this playbook to anyone, but like, if you can't execute it, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Um, so I just spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to execute it and, um, iterate on it and found some cool things that I was able to do and uncover because I didn't have to spend as much time as they did building the playbook. I would just iterate on it from there and, you know, follow what they did. So what do you think, what would you say your strong suit is now? I mean, I could give you my opinion on that, which, you know, I, I think that you're fantastic at marketing, marketing your brand and believing in it. Um, I know on social media, you're pretty hot and heavy on that and, and that resonates, you know, but uh, where do you think, you know, as president of Five Star, what's your, you know, what's your skill set that you're best suited at? Um, I, I, I kind of consider myself more of like an operator. Mm -hmm. Um, like these guys are the entrepreneurial spirit, big ideas, um, a lot of great ideas, a lot of ones that like eventually have to get passed off and executed on. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's where I feel like I kind of come in and added value to the entire organization, um, was, you know, taking some ideas or taking what they had started and continuing the momentum and keeping that kind of steady hand and executing on it. Mm -hmm. So now I really want to know this one because <clears throat> I'm guilty as charged when Hartwig says, Hey, Stevie D man, uh, you know, he tells me about a supplement, you know, that you guys have. And he says, Hey, run up to this store and, you know, pick it up. I'll tell so-and-so that, you know, it, it'll be on me when you get there. And I get there to get my free supplement. And I walk out, spend like 150 bucks. 
Right. So, so <laughs> which is so true. So I want to know the system that y'all have, because anytime I've ever been in your stores, your team members are like pros, right? They know their system. They know, and, and, and they, and they make you feel that you don't feel like it's a sales job. Right. And I think a lot of people, when they walk into a nutrition shop, they feel a little intimidated to go in and say, man, I feel like so-and-so, you know, this, this person's going to try to sell me some things that, that maybe I don't think that I need, but walk me through your culture and how that works mm-hmm. on your training with your team members. <clears throat> yeah. We, we started this from the, from the get go, you know, mm-hmm. I, it, it really wasn't implemented well at, at NutriShop. And so I kind of created my own little system on how to just create absolutely what I would say ruthless salesmen with like the most tact and, and ability to, um, not make it come off salesy. Mm-hmm. Right. And so by doing that, it's, which is just, an art, that's yeah. an art, man. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I wouldn't, cons- I, I think that out of the three of us, I would say the only like real natural salesman was Brian, mm-hmm. uh, you know, out of the gates, I would say that Cody and I, um, it was more acquired and learned, mm-hmm. but you know, <sighs> Man, I got so good, you know, in in all of us really. But but it was just this process. It was the playbook, and we taught it really well. And man, I would I would almost say that for many years we were almost too good at sales. Okay, and and, and, and unpack that for me. Yeah. So yeah. so somebody comes in. The first thing you do is like we had a rule before they get off the doormat. You're greeting them, you know, hand in the air. How are you? What can I do for you? Um, and then we opened up a series of questions that were open ended questions that would qualify that customer. Mm-hmm. And then every suggestion, it was because you know, hey, because you said right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you know, what does your diet look like? You know, what mm-hmm. are you doing in the gym? Mm-hmm. Um, what supplements have you taken before? What are you taking now? And then what's your ultimate goal? Mm-hmm. Right. And then everything that we you know we actually. God, I probably created the sheet in like 2011 or something, but we actually have this, you know, this sheet and there's been many iterations of that. Pull the sheet out. It's got all these sections and we say, hey, you know, because you told me you're looking to lose 15 pounds, Mm -hmm. I have the products for you and Mm -hmm. and this is what it is and this is what it does for you. And then we walk them around the store, we show them everything and then we get done and we say, hey, you know, based on what you're trying to do, listen, all the stuff I suggested to you is going to be fantastic for you. You know, we talked about the pre-workout stuff, the post-workout stuff. We talked about the vitamins and we talked about these, um, you know, these weight loss products as you're trying to lose weight or you know, these muscle products, you're trying to gain muscle. And, um, you know, this is them. What, what do you want to go with today? But everything mm-hmm. is, everything you're is into. Mm-hmm. recommended exactly to what they were trying to do. And mm-hmm. you, you, you know, it's all perfect for them. Right? It's hard for them to object that then. So then, point, yeah, yeah, you, yeah you know, it was and, it was all about personalization. It was yeah. kind of as much as you could create in that finite amount of time mm-hmm. for poor personalization, and then leaving the decision up to them, but instilling the need based on what they've told you. Mm-hmm. But, but to to touch on to touch on us being too good, uh-huh. I think we got to that point, and and we've evened that out. But but people would people would come in our stores and not know what hit them. You know, and <laughs> yeah. we were, we, we trained our people that well. I mean, you guys remember where it was just like, you know, yeah. and, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't that we ever created a uncomfortable environment. It just, our guys were that were good. That good. It yeah. was just putty in your hand. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then, and then Cody, you were about to chime in on something <laughs> on that. Yeah. The, the funny thing is, is like when we did that, like when we first started learning this, or for me, at least I knew nothing about sales, but I was great at sales in our stores. Mm-hmm. And over time, as you start to like dig into like, real professional sales, you, you kind of see there's like these underlying principles that every great salesman follows, right? Like it's, um, you, you got to understand what the customer's goals, wants, and needs are, whether you're selling a car or solar system, supplements, whatever it may be, right? If you don't spend that time, you're not going to get the information that is going to help you make the right suggestion, which is ultimately creating a solution. So mm-hmm. the funny thing is, is like, as organic as that was created and like the just tenacity of the sales spirit we had, it was very like uh, high level sales um, that could be applied to anywhere. And we see in our stores, at least people that take learning that sales process, like seriously and get really good at it. They like we our biggest loss of employees is to like unbelievably high paying jobs that we just like we pay you 15 bucks an hour. We can't pay you 70 grand a year. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, like mm-hmm. we can't match that for an associate, but they develop the skill set that can translate to really any sales environment. And they're usually way better than the average salesperson in that new environment they go to. 
Um, and it really is because like at the end of the day, it's super customer friendly as mm -hmm. well. Um, mm -hmm. Like we, we've added some layers to make it more um, same experience that Charlie alluded to, but more kind of opt outs for the customer. So they don't leave with that remorse. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like, like we somehow this process got created that initially drove a lot of business success and results. And it's, it's very married with customer experience. So it's not just you walk into a five star and like, you're going to meet the best salesman in the supplement space, you're going to walk in there and you're going to feel like these people really care about your mm -hmm. goals, wants, and needs. And they're making recommendations based off of that. And in our industry, th there was like the, n there was a lot of people that knew how to sell um, back when this all started, but they would just cut throat, sell you whatever the commission was, mm -hmm. whatever the highest, you Head know, stack was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and even in today's environment, um, like, you know, most of our employees are young, um, yeah. it's retail, it's not like super lucrative, um, at the entry level stages. And so like, we had to find a way for these young employees who don't want to sell to follow this process, mm -hmm. which like Gen Z is most of our workforce at the associate and manager level. Um, but they, they do want to help people like that's very like compelling to them to help people. And so all we've done over time is figure out how to just kind of like spiffy up how we deliver the sales process to our employees and train them on it to be more about helping people. And it's, mm -hmm. it's still funny enough, 10 years later, it's the exact same thing. You ask these questions um, and instead of uncovering your ammo so you can you know, like load the gun to mm -hmm. sell them yep, later, yep. it's, hey, you're asking these, these same questions to kind of identify their goals, wants, and needs so you can make the right recommendation. And then Ultimately, all of it, no matter how you spin it, gets the customer the best results. When mm -hmm. they walk into any of our competitors, um, if they don't do this process, they end up getting products that aren't tailored to their specific mm -hmm. needs mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, you know, will get short change on the results. So that's really like the whole beacon around the whole sales process is getting people results. So <clears throat> what resonates to me <clears throat> based off what y'all just said is that it, it comes down to authenticity. All right. And Charlie, you said that you and Cody aren't the natural born salesmen, but, um, and that Brian is, but you all believe in the product and you believe in the model and you know what the results will yield. And so I think that when you have, it's pretty clear to me that when you have a, a product that you're selling and it can sell itself, all you have to do is, is be the one that, that kind of leads the way, you know, with the, with the buying customer it, it doesn't make it easy, but it does make it easier, right, to accomplish your goal, which ultimately is to, you know, be in the black and not in the red. But, Brian, for you, when they say that you're the natural salesman, you know, help me understand that. I mean, you sold me when I first met you, you know, but you didn't even have to open your mouth and go, boy, I like that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, well, just to touch on one thing that you just said, Steve, too, to close out that other part of the convo is when you're getting, like, <clears throat> to your point, when you believe in it and you're getting this positive feedback loop, especially when you're running stores and you have customers coming in, thanking you, telling you about their results, you really, you know, it's like this nirvana and it's like, holy, and these products do work. What I'm doing is helping people. The business economics are working and it's just kind of this beautiful thing when it's all, you know, in equilibrium like that. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question on the natural sales thing, I mean, I would argue Charlie's a natural salesman, but maybe I didn't see him um, Early on. I saw him post having polished that off. Um, I think what Cody's referring to maybe or the him is kind of my power of persuasion that I have. <laughs> only it seems to be a yeah, yeah, only for yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I honestly don't know where it comes from. I, I couldn't tell you, but I think I've just I know I know of its existence, and so you know it's not it's not something where I'm like trying to convince people to do things all the time, but like there's certain points in time where you know if I feel like believe in something and it should happen. I, you know, I'm good at looking at all the pieces on the board and mm -hmm. figuring out which ones need to move where mm -hmm. to create that thing from happening. It, and it doesn't have to be by me just kind of pushing really hard. It could be by me not pushing at all, as long as the pieces on the board are arranged appropriately. So. Well, and um, I think that, I think it, that my dad's pretty charismatic. So, I mean, I, I think go. some of it's just, you know, it certainly comes from probably my dad's side and he was a, nat he was a salesman I and mean, he was a failed entrepreneur until he wasn't, yep. you know, until kind of, he was in his like late thirties. He had me late. He had a whole other family prior. Um, 
So I think a lot of, you know, the charisma piece comes there and then it's how you, how do you use it? How do you develop it? What do you do with your kind of gift and how do you refine it? Mm -hmm. And I happen to get into a business where refining my charisma and sales and all these things, it was happening, you know, at scale over and over and over every day for so many years. Well, I think ultimately mm -hmm. it ends up, uh, I mean, the clear and obvious to me is that you're all three in great shape, uh, not only physically, but emotionally and mentally. Right. And I think that you, you have to have all three of, well, I'd say two of the three of you guys are that way that one of you is, and y'all know which one that is. But, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, ultimately to your point, Brian, is that, you know, I, there aren't very many entrepreneur entrepreneurs that have walked this earth that haven't failed, that are successful, that haven't failed forward. Right. A successful entrepreneur does not fail back. All right, they fell forward. And to your point about your dad, whatever those uh, endeavors were that led to ultimately where he was uh, very successful at what he did, the same could be said about, you know, the four of us in this room. I mean, myself included. I've had ventures that, you know, I made some mistakes and they didn't work out. And, you know, yeah, you get up, you dust yourself off and you move on and then you go to the next one and maybe – Maybe you fell on that one, you know, but ultimately something does end up clicking. And for, for y'all, it did. And I'd like to touch on how you go from two, then you go to four. And then where does that, how did, where, when does that start ramping up and how does it ultimately get to the 60 plus stores that you have now? Yeah. That didn't happen to, overnight. To, to go back one more thing. And I think this is important for people who are in business. And I know Steve, you, you, you do all types of different things within the mortgage space. But um, one thing that was critical to our business is the fact that we, when people would come through our door, we would sell them the supplements, but we would help with their diet, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And nobody else did that. And so if they left our store and bought one supplement and we ultimately, let's just call it CLA, right? Just something that we know <laughs> is like, we're, we're going to sell them this. In the back of my head, this is not enough to really help them. But if I give them the information to really help with their diet and give them five or six tips, it doesn't matter what supplement that person walks out with. When they come back through the door, we all know that diet is just so critical, right? So everybody that owns a business, find complimentary things that you can offer within your business that really ha doesn't have anything to do with your business that's going to help your your, your your staying power, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I have called you many times yeah. over the years to ask for, hey, I need a, a, a broker to help, you know. Mm -hmm. sell my house. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, all, you know, you're my guy when yeah. I need to call you anything mortgage house, real estate sort of related. Right. And I think as you offer your customers additional pieces that you make really, you know, no money on, mm -hmm. find complimentary things to give your customers to then benefit. To you be the glue. Yeah. You want to be the glue. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a sticky mm -hmm. experience yeah. at that point. Right. You know, so, you know, people well, would so. talk, say that about you, that Dealing with Charlie can be a sticky experience. <laughs> Does it? But it doesn't have anything to do with business. I don't know what that means. Who have you been talking to? <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking. No about. No one. I was just listening. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to touch on that yes. before before we jump into how how we kind of expanded. And um, I would say, you know, Brian and I. I mean, we all kind of made mistakes, right? Like we, we, you know, the, the stores that I opened with, with Brian initially were not very successful. The, I mean, the no. first, like we had owner operators in some of these stores and it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. We were making a little bit of money, but it was nothing until we actually revealed what we should have been doing. Mm -hmm. And the amount of time and effort and opportunity that we put into some of these stores like Plano, Texas and Allen, Texas, yeah. and some of the stores we opened up in these bigger metros just didn't work. And, and, you know, even looking back, I can't exactly tell you why, because the real estate was good. Mm -hmm. Some of the demographics were there, you know, maybe the incomes were a little high, but over time we figured out what worked for us, right? Who our customer was, what type of markets we needed to open in the type of real estate mm -hmm. we needed, mm -hmm. uh, traffic counts, frontage, uh, co-tenants, all of these different things to make our business work. And, um, I think the biggest revolution in our business was, was, you know, I would like to point to two stores, one being Colleen, Texas, 
Mm-hmm. Because I military opened up, town. yeah, I was like, you know, let's try this military thing. These guys have got to be buying sops. Mm-hmm. And we used to go inside of our competitors and we were, again, the salesman in us, we'd figure out within a <laughs> minute, like a minute, <laughs> exactly how many customers they were seeing, and, you know, yeah. how much they were uh, doing in sales. They would just spill we, the beans and then we're like, this is where we need to be. But real quick, real quick, yeah, which, which competitors were those? I mean, I, I'm thinking of GNC. All of them. Yeah. Anybody yeah. would, it's like within a minute or two, yeah. like, we would go in, we'd have GNC all the numbers. Vitamin be, uh-huh. I mean, they'd be Vibration. pulling out their mm-hmm. sales books, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, we got to the we point just, where we were making business we, cards as if we were working for Gold's Gym, because yeah. like everybody wanted a Gold's Gym to come to their, their market. Uh, and so we would yeah, just say was, we're with Gold's yeah, Gym yeah, yeah, and yeah, like yeah, the numbers yeah, would just yeah. start spewing. Yeah. Territory manager. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but, you know, to go back, like w- when I opened up that store in Colleen, Texas, I mean, it was, it was like the aha moment, I mm-hmm. think for us, which is like. We don't need to be where there's hundred thousand dollar household incomes. Like we need to be where there's blue collar, um, you know, high blue collar disposable income with people who want to get jacked, mm-hmm. right? And okay. and our customer is a little bit more aesthetically based, more yep. weight loss, weight gain uh-huh. than it is kind of the GNC, you know, sixty year old buying vitamins, right? Yep. And uh, and then the second one I point to was was uh, a store that Brian and I owned when we opened up in Odessa, Texas. I believe in 2012, right, Brian? Or 13, 12 or 13. I think it was yeah, 12, late 12, and, November and 12. Man, you know these two stores is what catapulted us into being completely changing our model because we had a lot of. Well, I mean, I, I just go ahead and call them failed stores in uh-huh. the Dallas Metro. Mm-hmm. You know, many, many like what I would call yeah. failures that we I invested mean, we were, a lot of time and money. We into. were able to sell most of them off. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, shocker. And that was Brian who sold yeah. those, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it absolutely was. Because everybody saw our success and wanted to be a part of what we were doing. And yeah. so it's easy to say, but, hey, like take these, which yeah, is the, yeah, yeah. You know, the lower performers. That's that how Cody money, got his but, store. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, yeah. But I think, to, I think to Charlie's point in, in, in those two stores kind of unlocking this where we needed to be, but because we were, you know, we were grinding – Again, so much, at least I'll speak for myself in these stores in Dallas, like we were trying to squeeze every drop out of that orange. And so when you have that mindset, when you finally find that perfect market and you're doing every little thing, it's gangbusters. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, being forced to refine and not be sloppy, I think allowed us to take full advantage of these, these moments where we found the, the right market, put the right people in and boom, just explosion. And how many stores were y'all open in a year when y'all were trending up? Yeah, you know, like so around that time in Colleen, what store was that? And then where has it gone from there? I want to say so Waco was, I think, the fifth store. Uh or no, Allen was the fifth store. Waco might have been the sixth. Colleen was right in there in like seven or eight, mm-hmm. along yeah. with a few Abilene other in the Dallas was, Metro. Was early too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Abilene, Texas. Abilene was early. Yeah. So so you're getting a lot what I'm hearing is a lot of these sub markets. Right, mm-hmm. not these big metropolitan, S- secondary, towns. tertiary, uh-huh. blue collar with some uh-huh. disposable yeah. income is uh-huh. the yeah. Our military towns do so, those tend to rock it out for you guys. I would, I would say it's the best yeah. for us. Yeah, right? yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. What were you about to say, Brian? Yeah, I was going to say like there there was this. I think it was in 2011. So we we had like we knew some people involved in another franchise, and I won't even name it, but they were just crushing, and they were they were in a lot of small markets around the country, the Odessa, Texas, or the Midland, Texas, or these markets. And I, I, I recall, I don't know who, I think Charlie went and visited these guys. And I don't remember how he met them. They're one of them still a friend of ours today and was like, man, these guys are crushing it. Like, and so I went on this kind of West Texas tour shopping their stores and <laughs> the numbers they were doing was just out of this world. And to, to be frank, we literally just picked off every single one of their markets. We put our concept in there. We had a much better model. They were just first to market with no competition. And we basically just started taking their lunch money in all these markets. So we figured, and you know, they figured out the the demographics and the size of these markets. And then we sort of to the way Cody described kind of bolting on to our business and then improving it. And we just, we improved the business a lot mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we didn't reinvent the wheel, but you know, we, we identified where they were crushing it. Well, and you all had a better model. And you had a better, you know, you know, grassroots leadership that had actually been boots on the ground. You know, it's a, you could yeah. go from that point. And so, so y'all trend up, you end up ultimately with North of 60 stores. And I remember it was, it was back right before COVID. If I recall, 
y'all had negotiated a transition. Like y'all had y'all had it on the table with uh, with a group that was it was an acquisition type situation, and um, that didn't work out. COVID kicks in, and you know what went through your minds during that time? You know because at that point, you know people are all on lockdown. What happens in your stores? What happens with your you know with your revenue and with um, you know that overhead didn't go away. I mean, COVID Part one scary. was uh, yeah. bankruptcy lawyers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a day later, yeah. yeah. You, you know, we all got in a room. Cooler and, heads prevailed. You know, I think that uh, you know, you always look at the blow up scenarios, mm-hmm. right? You have sixty mm-hmm. something retail stores. You know, your average rent is you know, nor- probably around five or six thousand a month. So mm-hmm. you do the math, right? Mm-hmm. And and you're going, you know, this is our nut every month, and this is. This is, uh, you know, just rent. You're yeah. talking about keeping all your employees without revenue, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. HQ, in mm-hmm. stores. You can't, you know, if you blow it up, right, you lose everybody and you're done. Yeah. So you got to continue to pay all those folks. Yeah. And, and at that time, you didn't know what the government subsidies that was and before you knew be. if PPP was going to keep Yeah, you up. didn't know any of that, mm-hmm. right? You were just kind of throwing numbers on the board saying, this is what this could look like for yeah. us. And, and, it was, and it looked ugly. And, think, and, and yeah. for a few months, it was. Yeah. It was really mm-hmm. ugly. And, and you know, yeah. I think the nature of COVID, right, fortunately for us, made people think a little bit more about their health. So while we had mm-hmm. those the closure months and just the shit show of of, um, you know, wearing masks and people freaking out about going anywhere and all of that when, when it, I mean, three months in, or it was three or four slow months. And, you know, by June or July of 2020, I mean, this thing was, was, you know, some of the best numbers we'd ever seen. People were ready to get out of the house. That's you know, right. People were ready to get out of lockdown. And they were investing in their health. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Government mm-hmm. subsidies yeah. didn't, didn't hurt the, mm-hmm. the Yeah. You yeah. Know, Go- the, government was paying them to sit at home. Yeah. So, yeah. so burning a hole. Yeah. So. And PPP probably helped you all a lot. I would oh, imagine yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like um, definitely. I mean, well, substantially. Yeah. One, one I mean, thing it did. It too helped is, us keep everyone employed mm-hmm. is what it did. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think one thing it did too is like you know, we, fortunately we were in the southeast majority, so we didn't have a ton of full zero dollar <laughs> revenue days. Um, but ultimately, like as we got out of it and it was getting better and like we could breathe again, it, it allowed us to look back and realize how resilient the business actually was because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, we were bleeding a little bit, but I mean, we, we showed how yeah, we- adaptable the business could be mm-hmm. in some very harsh environments. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we came out of that, you know, while we had lost this opportunity to kind of realize all the hard work we had, you know, a couple months prior, it's like, well, this thing is battle tested to the, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's even more valuable in our eyes um, mm-hmm. from, from that point on. Well, and that's also where y'all just, uh, you know, you lock arms and you go into the, you go into the battlefield together and you say, we've got this. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. And I, I would say that, you know, you think through that to your point that y'all had a you have a strong presence in the states that were that opened up more quickly. You know, like California, as we know, New York, some of the states that they were on lockdown far longer than some of the other states. Um, I might argue that had you had a larger presence in those states, it would have been even more difficult for you. Yeah, it would have for sure. Yeah, did uh, no question. <laughs> We decided we wouldn't open in California. I mean, we just we refused to do it. it was like even before that, or oh afterwards? yeah, I mean, we decided yeah. that kind of years ago that we just wanted nothing to do with the state of California. And and was that because y'all aren't allowed to go there for some of the things that y'all did? No, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Chico State arguably yeah. Yeah, just yeah. Can never, you get close to campus. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Cody's yeah. definitely not invited you know, there, to Chico State. Um, <laughs> no, we just like the regulation and everything. Just was was you know. Yeah, had, there's strong correlation to the government overreach and you know the difficulty in doing business in these markets even prior, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, did y'all renegotiate any of your leases during that period of time? Get some would, reprieve, or did y'all try? Yeah. So, so I yeah. would argue that that it was it was an excellent opportunity for us to take advantage of using COVID as an excuse to get out of low performers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the sales pitch was, you know, and Brian and I kind of went through this, but. We had we had a restaurant chain as well. We'll yeah. get into that, but we had a restaurant chain that was just you talk about I bleeding. That. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, the one in Midland, yeah. I remember. Midland, it was Odessa, a great and yeah. So, so um, yeah, that's a good business experience, and, mm-hmm. and and that everybody should know is if you're yeah. really good at one thing, stop trying to do everything, mm-hmm. right? I think yeah. we we yeah. we eventually learn that where it's like you know you, you I think when you're young and you're in business, you just think you're invincible, Bullet and you're proof. like, dude, I can mm-hmm. do. Yeah. I, mean, I think you've probably Humility. seen a little bit of that where I you're have. just you're doing too many things, mm-hmm. and then you look back and you're like, God, I was really good at this. One. Mm-hmm. If I had just stayed, stayed on track on and done this mm-hmm. one thing, mm-hmm. and then went like this and branched out instead of going like this mm-hmm. thinking you can Went do everything wide. it's like god yeah um but that's definitely something that 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 sticks with us but uh but yeah to go back to your your question what we did is we would we went to landlords and we said mm-hmm. hey um we're bleeding mm-hmm. you know this this you know store's been closed it's 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 bleeding out we have some ppp money right and i can offer you three months of rent Otherwise, we're just going to have to shut, you know, shut up shop. And I don't, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I don't know if you're going to be able to get anything. And almost all of them came back and was like, I'll take the three months, yep. you know, of mm-hmm. rent, which was a nothing for a buyout. Yep. And so we actually, not only did we get a huge boost because of COVID and PPP obviously supplied us with the cash from the mm-hmm. missed revenue, it gave us a great opportunity to take advantage of, of that and, mm-hmm. and kind of, um, I guess, short up the portfolio and, mm-hmm. and kind of get rid of some of the low performers. So, you know, on our little oil and gas company that our family has out in West Texas, you know, we were a smaller operation, you know, gross revenue of four or 5 million had 20 something employees, but we got a half million dollars uh, worth of PPP money. Mm-hmm. And that really helped us bridge that gap, mostly just to make sure that the men and women were paid through that, you know? Yeah, and, I would... Yeah, I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think I think even for us, the PPP was used for the right purpose. We mm-hmm. kept our employees on, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And not yeah. only was it the best thing to do, I mean, obviously for the employees, keeping everybody on, because that's what you got PPP money for, mm-hmm. um, but it was the right thing for our business too, mm-hmm. for sure, long term. Because if, you know, our employees are everything to us, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. so... Mm-hmm. And y'all have, do you still have your, mm, I'm going to call them a retreat, but your leadership retreats that y'all would have where you get the crew and, you know, post COVID, because I know you did it every year, maybe twice a year, I can't remember, but leading up to COVID, are y'all still doing those where you have the big powwows with the, you know, leadership meetings? So we have, um, we're having one this year. It'll be the first one in four years. Um, you know, obviously in 2020, it got canceled. From was that COVID. was that a hazing incident? Or should we, talk about that? <laughs> uh, we got kicked off campus. Um, was, I, was that the incident? <laughs> and then uh, in 21, we had one scheduled. And I believe um, what happened? Um there was like, it was scheduled, flights were booked, everybody was coming and there was an incident in the office and it spooked some leadership that we have. And, uh, we pared it down to just our district managers. And then mm-hmm. last year we had a rough start to the year and pulled it as a, uh, consequence mm-hmm. for everyone. So, but this year it's back on and trying to well, that's be pretty it. exciting, you know, because I know that that was a big part of y'all's model was the camaraderie. Yeah. You know, with your managers and even, you know, all the way down to the person that was just hired the day before. Right. Yeah. And going back to what I, I think you had mentioned, Cody, you know, when you have an entry level employee who's coming in and, you know, they're hourly and, you know, maybe they're not making as much as what some of the others are, but they get the opportunity to see that they're part of a great organization that's going to train you up to where, hey, you know, if you ever wanted to open up your own store, your own brand, you are going to be their biggest cheerleader. Like you want to see them be super successful. And you have some of your employees that became managers that also became, you know, co-owners in some stores, right? I mean, at mm-hmm. the end of the day, you guys don't, uh, there's no glass ceiling with your team. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's, there's some nuance um, in there, but mm-hmm. not worth going down the rabbit hole. But yeah, so, <laughs> you know, these, these, <laughs> These retreats are just, you know, like going back to like where we put our locations, like our stores aren't super close to each other. So you can start to feel like you're on an island. Um, And so these bring everybody together. Everybody gets to share best practices, have some fun. Um, Usually someone gets overly drunk and gets fired, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's all right. And Um, that's why y'all are on the corporate side? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Nobody gets fired. Well, you get a lot of, well, hey, let's call it what it is. You get a lot of, you know, there are a lot of men in your world, not as many women. Yep. And you get a, a group of guys together that have high levels of testosterone, you know, that are the guys that are in the gym every day taking care of themselves. They're pumped. They're jacked. They're salesmen. They're competitive. You get them in that environment, and then you get a little suds, and you know the guys, 
you know, then you get some wrestling matches. <laughs> I mean, that's ultimately what ends up happening, right? <laughs> A quick note: There is women, but like they are far superior than the men in our company. Like Smart the women are, to say that. are very, very yeah. savage. Like <laughs> they have to exist in this environment, and they are killers. Um, but uh, yeah, so and then you know we're we're bringing back a similar opportunity that you mentioned, where like removing that glass ceiling, and mm-hmm. um, we're bringing back like an official franchise opportunity, and it's really catered to our employees. So we're trying to create that. Hey, like it's retail. It's not this huge opportunity mm-hmm. financially initially, but um, if you put your head down, you work your ass off, like you can then move on and own your own store. And I think part of our story that's really unique is like our like working in the stores, how critical it was to understand the customer beyond working in the stores. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm super fired up to one have the retreat, but two offer that kind of next step for people that come here, put their you know head down, bust their ass. Um, and then have that opportunity to go change their life, essentially. So forward-looking, what I'm hearing y'all say is that your model is you're going to have corporate-owned stores like what you have now, yep. but then look to expand to where you have franchisees that have you know a little skin in the game where they're they're on the line for the lease and they're on the hook for product that they're purchasing from you know from the parent company. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. And yeah, then what you're doing in turn, yep. obviously you're providing the product, you're but you're providing a model, you know, for them as well, yeah. a model of success. Right? Yeah. So it'll yeah. be focused on initially yeah. uh testing and rolling out to our employees as like their next step. Like not everybody's not every manager, great manager is meant to be a district manager. Mm-hmm. Um and so we want to create that pathway for them to come here, bust their ass, do well for the corporate stores, and then earn that opportunity to go, you know, change their life financially and um, own their own business. And the only way we could do that at this scale was through an official franchise program. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we're, I don't know what yard line we're on, but we're close, um, mm-hmm. marching down the field to make that official. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, were you about to say something? Charlie? Yeah, we, we, we use, so what, the way that the company used to run is we, we essentially would partner with like employees and we would give them sweat equity to move all over the country. So mm-hmm, that was kind mm-hmm. of the, I would say iteration two of our business. And we had stores and, and ownership structures and business partners everywhere. Mm-hmm. And in 2018, the three of us or 17 really came together and, you know, it was Brian initially just kind of led this and was like, guys, like we're all running our own organizations. You know, I had stores with Brian and Cody and Cody had stores and Brian had stores with his brother and I had stores with employees and Brian had stores with employees. And it was just this massive, Fragmented. yeah. And mm-hmm. so, but I will say my point was then you had this carrot that everybody was working towards, right? And and everybody would be like, God, I want to be a partner, right? And so you had that carrot. And then when we consolidated in 18, it was probably the best decision we ever had because we needed to, you know, everybody's running their own everything, mm-hmm. right? And so we consolidated and really created an HQ and all that, ever, uh, the other stuff that we needed. Um, but we lost the carrot. Right. Mm -hmm, Which mm -hmm. was like, you know, all corporate owned stores. And, you know, yes, there was the growth to be a district manager and, you know, um, but we lost that carrot. And I think we're gaining that back now to say that we're going to give these employees the opportunity to work towards something. And and so I think, you know, Cody just, you know, uh, obviously has been running most of the five star stuff, but he really cares about his people. And I Mm -hmm. think this is something he's super excited about. And we're all excited about to give these 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 folks the opportunity to you know, eliminate that ceiling essentially, right? Well, and Five Star and Defined, you have your own branding now, right? You have your own products, you have your own SKUs. Is that yeah, we've correct? We've had that for a while, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you've got four yeah. brands, yeah. 60 plus products, 150 SKUs, mm-hmm. Amazon presence, e Cody now handles the distribution. So we sell to a few hundred other retail stores that can sell our brands as well. Okay, okay. So the best of which are mostly our former employees. Yeah, former Is that employees. right? Yeah, they yeah. Just, because yeah. they follow the model. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's what I was going to say. You know, they go start their own, yeah. their own shops and yeah. they know how you you guys operate they know that you operate with integrity and you're priced right and yeah i mean and again that goes back to taking care of your 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 family your extended family right your your team members with your with your organization but i know that you know through covid and i don't know when it was that you really started to see that sharp spike on your online sales on your e-commerce especially amazon what have you guys touch on that you know how's that been for y'all um I would say it spiked and then normalized. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was just people transitioning to buying online. And then as students, things started to clear up, it started to wind its way back to like a n- slightly elevated prior uh, from prior COVID, but nothing crazy like right after. Mm-hmm. And most of what we've been reading or seeing in the news is, is similar. Mm-hmm. 
that there was a spike for a lot of folks and then people want to get back out and then they start normalizing their lives. And I mean, Amazon makes life, you know, pretty easy. And, you know, you, you order it and the next day it's on your doorstep. And that's the, you know, that's the model that a lot of people are looking at to, you know, to build businesses for y'all. Do you see that expanding even more? Has it, has it flattened out? And, you know, where's that curve for y'all in, you know, if I look up a year to five years from now, uh, it's hard to look five years from now ever. Like when mm-hmm. we sign leases, it's like, well, what were we doing five years ago? Like, shit, dude, totally yeah. different uh-huh. stuff. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, like the way our model works is we're kind of retail first. Um, we've tried other avenues and like what we know is retail. And mm-hmm. so we mm-hmm. treat our online presence as kind of a, a catch-all for what we put into the market through our stores. Um, we want our customers to be able to buy when, where, and you know whatever they want from us. And so that may be on Amazon. So if we're moving a lot of our brands to our stores and we also own the Amazon um, pages, like they're going to buy from us mm-hmm. just in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, so as long as we continue to expand our footprint and our distribution through our corporate stores, our franchisees, our wholesale channel, get the market out or the product into the market, like we own all of our e-commerce, Amazon presence. So they'll come back and repurchase from us there. Mm-hmm. And there's some things we do to try to incent like subscriptions and grow those types of um, revenue channels within the e-commerce. But we, we do the math all the time and we put, you know, 15 mile radiuses around our stores. Um, we, we put some around our wholesale customer stores to see if there's similar buying behaviors. And, and most of our e com business comes from 15 miles around a five-star nutrition. Okay. Okay. And, and that's even, um, and, and that's with, uh, sticks and bricks and, or, you know, mortar locations. And mm-hmm. yeah, I just think that, you know, with where online and retail, I'm sorry, uh, e-commerce sales are going, I just, you know, that's obviously a part of your model that you have now. And to your point, five, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, you didn't have that as part of your model. So then you look forward and you say, well, five years from now, there might be an opportunity that we're not even thinking of. Right. Right. Um, now it wouldn't yeah. be, you know, I wouldn't want to go without talking about for a minute, um, you know, on, on our visit, the fact that y'all, y'all fa- found a fantastic CEO and a fantastic CFO to really, you know, uh, you know, take the company. You guys have it stabilized. You guys are doing fantastic, but Charlie and Brian, Y'all have stepped out a little bit because the leadership is doing such a great job. Obviously, your fingerprints are all over the company, but y'all are dealing in real estate now. Y'all are doing some development. Uh, you're heavy into short-term rentals. Uh, Brian, let's start with you. I know that you've got, uh, is it uh, four or five short-term rentals and you know five or six commercial properties and some development. Kind of walk us through that and, and, and why you're doing that. Um, yeah, let me try and kind of start and make the easiest direct answer to that. So, you know, we were all running the company together. I was CEO, Cody was president of all five star Charlie was chief innovation officer, product sales and everything. And so coming out of COVID or into 2021, you know, we had a, a CFO who had really, you know, been a partner with us since 2018 when Charlie touched on us consolidating all these ownership structures and rolling this company up and he was, you know, he had kind of gotten us to the point that he'd signed up for, which is, you know, had a package that we could put on the market. You know, as you touched on it, we didn't end up selling, but he was getting ready to move on. And I don't know, I had this wild idea and I was like, hey, what if, you know, what if we kept him on and, and offered him a role as CEO? It would allow me to kind of elevate out of the business initially. And over probably starting in 2019, I had started to um, get interested in real estate. Uh, a buddy of mine actually got me interested. I was so hyper focused on what we on our business for the first 10 years that I I've never looked anywhere else. I didn't care about any other investments. You couldn't tell me anything. You know, what we were doing was all I cared about doing. And, you know, started to want, I think, other challenges. Like, you know, I had that desire to sharpen the saw and kind of learn other stuff. So I was spending a lot of my time and my evenings and and stuff like learning about real estate. And I started and I bought a few investment properties and repositioned them, renovated them short-term renting them. And I had a desire to kind of expand that business, just real estate in general. And I saw it as a good opportunity to um, create diversity of capital for the three of us. And so I I just proposed, Hey, like, let me take a bunch of this capital that we have collectively. Let's create a, like a real estate investment sort of fund, just us and I'll go and I'll invest it into these different asset classes. And I'll be kind of a steward of that capital so that we can start to create some other 
um, avenues of income and revenue and just diversify from, you know, what's, what is a high risk business, right. And is purely a, a cash flow business in the supplement space. And so that was kind of the, I think the entry into it. That was the entry into it. And then what about you, Charlie? I mean, you jumped on board right out of the gate and, you know, you guys haven't looked back since then. And mm -hmm. yeah, I know that you've got the developments here, uh, you know, out on Lake LBJ, you've got those, you've mm -hmm. got the ones down at the Texas coast. Mm -hmm. Of course you have the one, you know, there in Silverton, Brian, that you're involved with. You've got your yeah. properties in Aspen, but yeah, you know, what I'm, what my takeaway from that is, is that y'all do really enjoy the flavor of the short-term rental markets, but it's gotta be in the right market. Yeah. But I mean, Brian's, Brian's the yeah. guy on that, but yeah, you know, we, <laughs> He, he did plenty of research into this, right? Mm -hmm. And then he was kind of the first one to test it. Mm -hmm. But there's tools, you know, AirDNA and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But, you know, he certainly did a lot of his research. And, you know, and then some of it, you know, some of these, I guess, passion projects like a beach house and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, you end up building and there's a bunch of juice in it. But, mm -hmm. you know, that deal. But... Um, but yeah, most of most of the the real estate stuff was 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 Brian led, and and it and it's not just the short term stuff. Like we have a, a whole portfolio of investments, and he meets a lot of people, and you know gets the right relationships, and we're invested into all types of asset classes, which is nice to mm -hmm. diversify mm -hmm. your portfolio. But mm -hmm. you know, not ha you know not having your eggs all in one basket being the nutrition stores is mm -hmm. super important, right? So. Mm -hmm. Hard yeah. assets, hard assets, hard assets, mm -hmm. and and you know tax yeah. beneficial mm -hmm. investments. I think mm -hmm. is Brian what Brian's got really good at is making sure that you know what you're investing in. Right, you're it's a wealth building mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, you know you're not going to get rich right away on real estate, but mm -hmm. you're going to build a ton of wealth and you're going to have a ton of tax benefits. And so and so in several of these properties, y'all have enjoyed for your personal use. You know, like mm -hmm. the condo that I know that y'all bought with. Mm -hmm. Our boy that's Jordan, cool. you know, mm -hmm. that's uh, how many how many properties do y'all have within within the group? You know, yours um, individually and yeah, I mean, we we probably have eight or nine kind of properties that are you know mostly like short term rentals. So I run a handful of them um, via I have someone that works for me, and we run a little short term rental kind of vacation rental management business for our properties. Um, we have a few others with other partners that, that they operate, and then we have, I mean, probably a dozen commercial investments just through various syndications. So multifamily condo development, um, a couple just land development deals, mm -hmm. um, uh, assisted living facilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, but most of those, so it's kind of like the way I approach it is I got into short-term rental as like a direct ownership asset class at the time. It was like the yields were so much better than anything else. And mm -hmm. I felt like if I treat it like a business and not a hobby, it wouldn't be that difficult. And so I, hired someone on way before I needed someone so that when I needed someone, I had someone mm -hmm. and it didn't become something that I had to do. So I have a really great like asset manager who's worked for me for a few years that runs them and, you know, it cuts the cost of management in a fourth of what you'd pay if you use a third party management company. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I kind of looked at how to get exposure to other asset classes and, you know, during, you know, up until right now, multifamily was like a big sponsor, big cash person's game. And so the, the really the best way to get exposure to a good asset class like that was to invest with sponsors who were raising money as just a passive investor. And so we've been able to get exposure there. And like Charlie said, I mean, I meet different people and I, you know, people talk about real estate and I meet them at the gym. I meet them at the coffee shop. It just doesn't matter where. And I get to talking if they, you know, and sometimes they'll introduce me to good sponsors. I'll do a lot of research and, that's how we'll approach investments. And then we kind of, I fell into a few land deals. It was hella skiing in Silverton and met a guy who mm -hmm. owned the hotel I was staying in. And we ended up partnering on a deal. And then our real estate investment company ended up in investing a lot of the capital into that deal. So it's happened in a lot of ways. I think at the end of the day, it was like, I wanted to be in real estate. So I've kind of like just jumped into it for a lot of time at night when I was still running to find. And then I was like, Hey, can't really do both of these. I mean, I could, but I don't want to. And so like, I'd rather approach real estate specifically and not have so much of my own personal time to define. And like I said, that was how that whole process emerged with our CEO taking over. And then, um, you know, right now I, I more or less spearhead those investments and, you know, they don't take all my time. Mm -hmm. So it gives me some free time still. And I, you know, I'm able to spend some time at define on the str strategic side and, our annual quarterly weekly meetings and those sort of things. Does it, does it give you free time to, to go powder skiing? And when you're doing that, you have a photographer that 
rides along right next to you and uh, takes a great shot of you, and then you end up taking that to a printer, and then that printer uh, puts it in a frame, and then that ends up on your wall behind you? It's more or less how it happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, my takeaway... A little nuance, <laughs> but that's more or less it. <laughs> you know, my takeaway from that is that, as they say the old adage, birds of a feather flock together, right? And the three of you gentlemen, along with your team, you know, y'all are not only flocking, but you're soaring, right? And I've admired y'all from the outside in, and, and y'all have blessed me uh, for being able to be a part of your spirit and on the inside because, you know, I've learned a lot from y'all over the years. And, you know, the one, one of the many qualities, but the one that just really stands out is the humility that all three of you possess and your, your people skills. I mean, you're all three just really, really good with people. You're honest. You're forthright. Um, you do business the right way, but you do friendships the right, the right way. And I've had a chance to be around some of your other fraternity uh, brothers, and that is a strong pack. That's a strong group, that Chico State group. Watch out. I mean, it really is. And, you know, it, most people would be like, Chico State, where is that? Well, it's in Chico, California. Hello. You know, it's, uh, you know, Northern California. But that's a good group of guys that y'all run with keep running keep flying and if it if it wasn't for a matter of you know hartwig having to get out of here to go pick up the the kiddos at school i feel like we could stay on for for two or three hours i mean what we're talking about today oh, yeah. our deep dive that we're making i mean we're we hadn't even made it three feet into the water so i want a commitment from y'all that at some point in the near future that we pick this up because I, I think that the the audience that we're speaking to, uh, you know, our friends that we have that are going to watch this and learn from this, they have a lot that they have learned, but there's more that they can. So I, I want to have you guys back on. But I appreciate you coming out today, Brian. We appreciate you zooming in from uh, from Aspen, my brother. Always great to see you. And uh, Cody, you're the man. You know, you've got four ladies there at the house that you mm -hmm. wrestle, and then Hartwig, you and your three boys. I, I love each of you, and uh, and thank you all for being on our show, Mentor Five Fifty Five. Thanks for having Appreciate us, Steve. Yeah. yeah, thanks we'll for having back. us. Love to pick this back up. Yeah, we'll do it. Cheers, guys.